So as we've gone through our kind of journey into biochem, we have talked about four different groups. We've talked about lipids, we talked about carbohydrates, and we talked about proteins. And now we're to the fourth group, which is nucleic acids. And we're also gonna talk about how they go through and synthesize proteins. Now, one of the most kind of amazing properties of living cells is their ability to produce nearly exact replicas of themselves through hundreds of generations. And that process requires that certain types of information be passed unchanged from one generation to the next. And that transfer of necessarily necessary genetic information to new cells is accomplished by means of biomolecules called nucleic acids. So nucleic acids are gonna just help us transfer um, our genetic information. Now, genetic information, just as a reminder, um, is just that information um, that controls inherited characteristics of individuals in a new generation, as well as determines the life processes. So without further ado, we are gonna jump into the things that make up our nucleic acids. And so just as a reminder, our nucleic acids are things like DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, and ribonucleic acid, which is RNA. So, um, nucleic acids are just the biomolecules that transfer genetic information from existing cells to new cells. And these are classified into two categories. One is ribonucleic acid, which we call RNA, and this is mainly found in the cytoplasm of the cells. And then deoxyribonucleic acid, which is primarily found in the nuclei of the cells. Now, both DNA and RNA are polymers, um, and so they have repeating structures or monomers, and the monomers of nucleic acids are called nucleotides. Um, so nucleic acids are polymers, and they are composed of nucleotides, which are monomers, and those mon monomers are, um, nu the nucleotides themselves are composed of three kind of simpler components. They've got a nitrogenous base, a sugar, and a phosphate. And we're gonna look at these in the next few slides. So a nucleotide is just a repeating structural unit or monomer of the polymeric nucleic acids. Okay, and so we've seen polymers through many of our different um, biological molecules. Carbohydrates can make polymers, proteins make uh, poly proteins are polymers. Um, and so this is just another polymer. The only one that doesn't really have polymers are lipids. So I love kind of how this is shown. These are, this is what a nucleotide is. We're gonna have a nitrogenous base, which is gonna be here. That's just a base with nitrogen. We're gonna have a sugar molecule here that's got five carbons and then a phosphate group. And so this is a nucleotide. Now let's talk about nitrogenous bases. Um, when we talk about nitrogenous bases, there are five of them, and these are um, divided into two categories. The two categories are purines and pyrimidines. So for our nitrogenous bases, we have purines, and we have pyrimidines. 
Now, pyrimidines are um, single, six-membered, rings that contain two nitrogen atoms. Okay, there are three pyrimidine bases. These are uracil, thymine, and cytosine. And they're shown for you right there. Um, When we look at these, cytosine is found in both DNA and RNA, thymine is in DNA only, and uracil is in RNA only. So there's, there's some nucleic acids that are in both DNA and RNA, then there's thymine, which is in DNA only, and uracil, which is in RNA only. Now, when we talk about purines, purines are a fused ring. Um, that contains both a six-membered ring with two nitrogen atoms and a five-membered ring with two nitrogen atoms. Now, there are two of these, adenine and guanine, which are shown here for you. And these are um, DNA, both, both of them are found in DNA and RNA. Now, these are connected to a um, sugar component right? And so the sugar component of RNA is D-ribose, which is shown here. And in DNA, the sugar component is deoxyribose. And the big difference between these two is on the second carbon, there's no oxygen bonded to that carbon. There's a hydrogen on deoxyribose instead. Now I want to remind you about how we count using carbohydrates. Uh, remember the anomeric carbon is number one and we identify the anomeric carbon because it's the carbon that's bonded to two different oxygen atoms here. Um, the phosphate component is derived from phosphoric acid um, and it exists in an ionic form and has a negative two charge. So you're going to see we've got a negative two charge here. So these undergo a condensation reaction and what happens in this condensation reaction um, that we see is that the sugar component will undergo a condensation reaction with a nitrogenous base. So, for example, right, the pentose will undergo a condensation reaction with a nitrogenous base. Now I want to remind you with the condensation reaction we also form water here. Now I want to point out we formed a new glycosidic bond here between the, the first carbon of the sugar and um, the a nitrogen of the whatever nitrogenous base that we have. Okay then right that product here, right here, is called a nucleoside, right, with an S. Now, this can go through another condensation reaction, so we get another molecule of water here with phosphate. And now, we see that the phosphate is attached to the 5 position of the sugar. So the nitrogenous base is attached to the one position and the phosphate is attached to the five position of the sugar. When this occurs, 
This is called a nucleotide. Now, the way that I remember this is when you think about the alphabet, and we go in alphabetical order, Q, R, S, and then T. We have S is first, right, where these two condense, and then second is T, where we've got all three things. And so that's the way I remembered it as a student. If that works for you, that's great. If not, just ignore that advice. But I remembered it using alphabetical order that as we went farther in the alphabet, there were more components that were attached. So I want to make sure, I just kind of want to make sure that, that we've got this. A nucleotide contains the nitrogenous base, a sugar, and a phosphate. And then a nucleoside contains only the sugar and the nitrogenous base. Okay, and I wanted to show you um, the nucleotides of all five of the different um, the, of, of all five of the different nucleotides that we could see, right? And so I want you to notice here that in red, we've got the D here, and that's what we find in DNA, is in red. And so, and then in black is what we find in RNA, okay? Um, now, these are all monophosphates. Mono just means they have one phosphate group. And so that's where that comes from. Adenosine is the um, nitrogenous base. So you can see that that will change between all of them. And then what you're going to see here is if it's the deoxy lacking the hydrogen, I'm sorry, lacking the OH, if it's the deoxy with DNA, that has that deoxy prefix. Now, some people are visual and some people are um, table people. Uh, if you learn best using a table, um, I have a table here with the bases for um, RNA, uh, the nucleosides that they have here, um, and then the name of the nucleotides. So this would be the three and this would just be the two. Okay, so adenine forms a nucleoside of adenosine when it's attached to the sugar and then, sorry, yeah, nucleoside, and then it forms a nucleotide when um, we have that monophosphate that's attached. I want you to notice there's a little D in front of the ones in DNA for that deoxy as well as deoxy being right here. So if you are a table person, this is for you. Let's talk about the primary structure of DNA. Um, we talk about the primary structure of DNA. These are incredibly large molecules. Now, the nucleotides are joined together by nucleic acids, well, in nucleic acids by phosphate groups. So, nucleotides are joined together in nucleic acids by phosphate groups that connect the five prime carbon of one nucleotide to the three prime carbon of the next nucleotide, okay? Um, these are done through the phosphate groups. So um, this is called a nucleic acid backbone, and this is just the sugar phosphate chain that is common to all nucleic acids, which is that RNA and DNA. And what we see here is we see a phosphate and a sugar, and then remember the nitrogenous base sticks out from the sugar. 
okay? And so we end up with this chain of alternating phosphate and sugar units, and then the nitrogenous base is sticking out. And this is that primary structure of DNA, okay? So this is our primary, uh, that, stand, that one degree is primary structure of DNA. So I want us to look at an example of this. Um, this particular example is a tetranucleotide. Tetra just means four, and it's a partial structure of a DNA molecule. Now, notice that we have the end here of the segment, right, um, has, no, that has no nucleotide attack attached is the five prime end and I want you to look at the sugars and what you can see here is the phosphate is attached here to the five prime end and the next phosphate is attached to the three prime end so the sugar backbone goes from the five prime to the three prime end okay so sequences of bases along the backbone are read from the five prime end to the three prime end, right? Now, because the backbone structure doesn't vary, um, a polynucleotide structure may conveniently be abbreviated by only giving the sequence of the bases, okay? So we abbreviate this with only the sequence of the bases. And notice the bases are attached at the one prime. So the bases are attached at that one prime carbon. So we've got a five prime to three prime end and the bases are attached to at the one prime. And so what we would, how we would represent this particular chain is we would say, all right, hey, look, we've got the five prime end and it goes from A, C, G, T to the three prime end. Okay. So we go from the five prime to the three prime. Now, the secondary structure of DNA uh, was proposed in 1953 by, um, American biologist James Watson and English biologist Francis Crick. Um, there is a lot of controversy around this particular discovery. Um, so James Watson and Francis Crick. Uh, particularly the, the biggest um, kind of uh, issue is that Rosalind Franklin was the first person to take x-ray uh, pictures of DNA to be able to see the double helix. And they, Watson and Crick, used her um, pictures without her knowledge uh, to publish the structure. Um, and so they ended up with a Nobel Prize for DNA, I believe in 1965, but don't quote me on that. Um, but so, and and she probably also should have been named as far as as far as that Nobel Prize was concerned. Um, sorry, I said 1965. They got the Nobel Prize in 1962. Now, let's talk about the secondary structure. What we we know here is that um, it is two intertwined. polynucleotide chains and so it makes a double helix um, and these run in opposite directions with the nitrogenous bases pointing inward. So we have in purple here, the five prime to three prime end, 
And then on the other side, we have the five prime to three prime in. So these are running in opposite directions. And we can see that these molecules, these nitrogenous bases are on the interior and that they pair up and they pair up in such a way that we can predict where the guanine pairs with the cytosine and the thymine pairs with the adenine. And so these are called complementary base pairs. Right, and so we have adenine and thymine. And when they pair up, they make two hydrogen bonds. And then we have guanine. Ooh, that's a wild G. Let's do better. Guanine and cytosine. And they have three hydrogen bonds. Okay, and so those are the bonds that they make there. Now, um, one of the things that's interesting here is these percentages are always going to be equal to each other. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you have DNA, so for example, we've got human DNA. Human DNA has 20% guanine, right? Which means then that it also needs 20% cytosine, right? For a total of 40%. Okay. And then it has 30% adenine. And because each adenine is going to be hydrogen bonded to thymine, it also ends up with, we have 30% thymine for a total of 60%. And that gives us, of course, 100% over here. So what you're going to find is these percentages are of guanine and cytosine are going to equal each other, and the percentages of adenine and thymine are going to equal each other as well. Now let's look a little bit more closely at these base pairs. Um, so here is adenine and thymine, and their base, and you can see their two hydrogen bonds right here. Um, and then you can look here at guanine and cytosine and see their three hydrogen bonds here. And you can see, I like this image just a little better because it shows you the three hydrogen bonds and then the two and then the three hydrogen bonds. Um, now, the DNA structure here is stabilized by hydrogen bonding between the bases that extend inward. So those hydrogen bonds really stabilize the DNA molecule. Now, Let's do a um, let's do a problem. So it says this, and so I want to do an example. One strand of DNA, a DNA molecule has the base sequence CCATTG. What is the base sequence for the complementary strand? Now you need three things to solve this problem. Um, one thing that you need to know is the base sequence of DNA is always written from the five prime to the three prime end. So the original strand, right, is five prime C C A T T G to three prime. Now the next piece of information that you need to know is that adenine is always going to be paired with thymine, thymine, and guanine is always going to be paired with cytosine. Okay. And so in double-stranded DNA, the strands run in opposite directions, right? So when we start to solve this problem, we know that what we're going to see here for the complementary strand is it'll start at the three prime end. And so then we would have G, G, T, A, A, C goes to the five prime end, okay? So, so that would be from the three prime to the five prime. And then when the convention's followed and the sequence to the complementary strand is kind of written out as a whole, it's five prime G, G, oh, nope, I messed up. Super easy to do. So let's back up because we've got to start over here at the five prime. C, A, A, T, G, G, three prime. Now my suggestion is to show this step here um, before you write it here so that if, 
if there's some sort of error here, I can give you partial credit for that because it's so, so easy to do. All right, now, the last thing we're gonna talk about in this screencast is how these, um, how DNA is packaged. So when we talk about DNA, um, DNA is packaged into chromosomes. So each chromosome um, contains one molecule of DNA that's coiled tightly around a group of small basic proteins called histones. Um, individual sections of DNA molecules make up the genes, and that's really the fundamental unit of heredity. Okay, so because genes, well, let me say this, because genes direct the synthesis of specific proteins. So when we look at this, we have DNA here. It wraps up around histones, and these histones come together to make chromosomes, and those are kind of your X's and Y's and things like that that you've seen before as far as chromosomes are concerned. So if you've seen chromosomes before, that's what we're talking about there. So let's give some words to what we've said. Um, a chromosome is just a tightly packed bundle of DNA and protein that's involved in cell division. Right, and we've got histones, right, which are small, basic proteins that DNA wrap around. Right, and then DNA contains these segments called genes, which are these fundamental units of heredity, right, and each gene. directs the synthesis of a specific protein, right? Now, the number of genes contained in a structural unit of an organism varies with each type of organism. So, for example, a virus um, will carry a few to several hundred genes, whereas a bacterial cell like E. coli contains about a thousand genes. And then human cells contain about 25,000 genes. So obviously these become um, uh, quite complex. Now what we're gonna look at in our next screencast is we're gonna explain how DNA is duplicated for the next generation. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop by my office.